Okay, you guys ready to take another little walk with me? Check out those oaks just leafing out up there. It's springtime. It's been about, oh, it was maybe 80 degrees today. It's the warmest day of the year so far. But uh, it's starting to cool down a little more now that it's in the afternoon. And yeah, I thought it'd be a nice day for a walk. Now coming up here, laying on the side of the trail, is a mushroom I found as I passed through here earlier. And I uh, wanted to show it to you guys. I think it's probably one of the most uh, majestic mushrooms that we get around here. Well, the whole family is kind of majestic. You know what, I'll spoil the fun. It's uh, one of the Amanitas. It's the spring cockera. Um, and all of the Amanitas have Oh, here it is. Check out this beauty. Hey, look at that. So all the Amanitas have this vulva, which is this uh, cup-shaped white part at the bottom. And they begin life as like a small little egg. It almost looks like a puffball. And they'll erupt out of that. And so you always want to check if you're the kind of person who would eat a puffball and cut it in half. Make sure it doesn't have a you know, mushroom with a, with a cup or with a cap, rather, uh, outline in, and you want your puffballs to be solid white. Um, because if it does have the mushroom outline, then it's one of these Amanitas. And so, also, you'll see it has a very, uh, well, it's kind of fleshy and thin, but it's quite large, this ring on the inside. And then white gills. And then the spring cockera has, and let's see if we can make this out. See these little tiny striations? on the edge. They're kind of hard to make out because this one's kind of dirty. But it's these little lines as you reach the edge of the cap. Um, if you want to look for that, you want to look for like a bright yellow color and then a prominent white cap. And that white cap is actually just the remnants of the egg or the vulva as it erupted out of the ground. And so, yeah, that is your spring cockera Amanita. I'm actually going to take this one with me. We'll carry it along and continue down the trail. So this little section I walked down uh, earlier, obviously, and saw the mushroom and decided it would be probably a good time to take a video. But uh, we're going to cross the little trail up here in a second, and I have not walked this yet today. So we'll see what we can find. It'll catch me off guard. I had no time to prepare or, you know go over the thoughts in my head. Maybe it'll be nothing interesting whatsoever. And Kamu's with me. He's lucky. I'm leaving him off leash today. I'm going to give him a chance to be good, but if he runs off, you'll see how much of an embarrassment he can be on video. Oh, you look at this. If you look down these holes, you can see there's a bunch of leftover Amanita eggs. All these little holes everywhere. So there must have been Amanitas growing here. And maybe the deer ate them, or maybe somebody came along and picked them. Uh, I don't know. Did the deer eat the Amanitas around here? Maybe they know which ones are poisonous and which aren't. Because the Death Cap and the Destroying Angel, which are two of the most deadly mushrooms 
uh, in the world, I believe, uh, are both Amanitas, uh, but they're solid white, um, the death cap with a slight yellowish tinge to it. But I want to show you this up here, this beautiful conch mushroom. Uh, this one's called, I don't know the scientific name, but it's the conifer maize polypore. And we look at those pores. I think that's why they call it a maze. So they're not, they're pretty irregular. And I imagine that's where it gets its name. Oh, look at that. I found one of the Amanitas. Let's check out what was growing over here. Oh yeah, more spring cockera looks like. But it does look like it's been eaten. Oh yeah, you can see the deer teeth marks on there. They're scraping away the gills. They didn't eat the whole thing. They left it for me to find. So that's pretty cool to see. What'd you see back there, huh? Oh, you found a little stick. Or is that some poop? That's a stick. That's a relief. Come on, pup. What do we got here? Nothing. Sometimes you want to check those little squirrel holes because there might be like a truffle poking out or it might be, uh, you know, a mushroom just starting to get going. So it's always worth a check, even if you find nothing there.
Oh, here's something notable. Which I should, oh, there's a deer. There goes Camus. Let's just watch him chase that deer. <laughs> anyway, he'll come back. He can't catch him. He's too fat and slow. So, I don't know when that cut off. I just looked down, started talking, and I wasn't recording anymore. But we're going to pick it right back up. And I want to talk briefly about pine cones. Um, well, the first one we're going to show you is actually not a pine, but this right here is the Douglas fir cone. And so it's really easy to tell because it has these little uh, projections coming out between the, I don't even know what they're called, the parts of the cone, I don't know. Anyway, I've heard them uh, called mouse ears before, which they kind of look more like mouse tails. Maybe that's what it was and I'm just messing it up. Anyway, that's Douglas fir. And then on the ground over here, we have a much bigger pine cone. And this is the ponderosa pine and it has these uh like points on the on each of the parts of the cone that point upwards and down at you know we're probably at about 3,000 feet now uh there's this is the only cone that has those points so let's see if we can find some more pine cones further down the trail those are the only two in this immediate area but uh there's one or two other cone-bearing plants around here that we might run into if we're lucky. Got some more town's tongue. I wasn't there last time. They grow pretty fast and flower even faster, so it's not too surprising. But they're a pleasure to see. You know, it just occurred to me, I wonder if that deer that Camus chased was the one who ate all those Amanitas. He's just enjoying a meal and my dog comes along and messes with him. Oh, here's something to show you. So, the bleeding hearts are now in flower. And, uh, yeah, can you guess why they call them bleeding hearts? Look at those beautiful flowers. Absolutely stunning. And I know there's like an East Coast bleeding heart, which is more of a bush shaped. And these ones are just kind of low growing. That's the difference between the Eastern and Western, as far as I know. What do we got here? This is either a mushroom or maybe a gopher hole, but it's worth it to check. Looks like a gopher hole or something like that. Anyway, no mushroom. Gotta check every single one. Never know what you find.
you can see down by the river, almost everything down there is leafing out. And all the leaves are so small, you could still kind of see through it, but pretty soon that's just going to be a sheet of green. Oh, what do we got here? You know, I have no idea what that is. Some kind of monocot. But it's not something that I can tell in that stage. Maybe once it, uh, uh, once it flowers, I'll be able to tell. I'm going to have to pay attention to that. Very nice. Here's, um, well, you know what? I don't know what kind this is quite yet because there's two species and I cannot pronounce the genus, but uh, it's false Solomon seal. You can see it's about to flower and once that flower fleshes out, then I'll really be able to tell. There's the starry flowered one and then just the uh, Western false Solomon seal, I think. And you can see it's also a monocot and monocots have these parallel veins that run down the end of the leaf. They don't have like, uh, I'll try to show you, this is like a dicot leaf on this, uh, this honeysuckle here. So dicots have the central vein and then they have the veins coming off of the central vein and so they're not parallel. And the monocots have all of these parallel veins running down the leaf. So that's one of the, you know, two major groups of plants you can immediately tell the difference between. And yeah, since we were out here last, a lot of these rattlesnake plantains, another orchid, has gotten a lot bigger. I'm really excited to see them flower this year. This seems like a good spot to probably see them flower. More of the Solomon seal there. More of the star flower. It almost looks like uh, it's shiny like the poison oak, but uh, you can't get any rash from it, so no danger there. So yeah, that's another dogwood. That's the um, uh, Cornus serica, I think, which is the black fruit dogwood. And it's not the only dogwood around here, but it's a pretty easy one to tell because it often grows along these little streams or any place where it's wet. You see it all growing out there and leafing out. Everything's running nice after the rains we got. That appears to be a new dam built by one of the people who also hikes this besides me out of this fallen incense cedar. I don't know why they would do that, but it's made kind of a deep pool here. Anyway, let's keep going. Oh, here's a treat. Kind of hard to make out, I guess, from here. But this is the other, one of the other dogwoods, anyway. This is the Pacific dogwood. With those flowers at the end there, those white flowers. This is Cornus uh, natalii, I believe. And, uh, let's see, I guess I can get up there. Let's look at one of those flowers up close. Nope, you know what? I can't. That's the best I can do. It's against the cloud from behind. But yeah, it's beautiful. White flowers that show up before the leaves. Maybe there'll be one further down that I can show you from the top down. But they get these gorgeous red, I don't know, maybe it's like a conglomerate, like a berry or something. Um, but, you know, from the top of the flower there, they turn bright red. I'm sure the birds eat them and spread them around. That's usually the case with red berries.
Got a gooseberry here. The Ribes, uh, probably Sierra goose bay, uh, gooseberry, in which case it would be uh, Ribes Rosley. I think that's how you pronounce it. R O E Z L I I. Oh, this is uh, just sprouting, just coming out. I think that's a trail plant, which you know I don't know much about, but those arrow-shaped leaves, or heart-shaped leaves, arrowhead-shaped leaves, pretty distinctive. I've only seen it a handful of times, so it's only really a guess. Don't take my word on it. Some more flowers of so the Pacific hound's tongue. This is a little mushroom. Let's check out what the gills look like. Oh, whole thing came out. Okay, this one is a poisonous mushroom called sulfur tufts, which is a hyphaloma, I think. Anyway, I'll correct it if I'm wrong. But uh, yeah, I think you can make a like a yellow dye out of these. And you can see the gills are kind of blackish, but they have on the young ones like this yellowish tinge around the edges. That's what screams sulfur tough to me. But yeah, even though it's a poisonous mushroom, you can fear not, you can touch them all you want. You can even taste the most deadly mushroom. Uh, just don't swallow it, but you can taste it if you're really bold and daring. Uh, I would not recommend that. I'm just saying, it's possible. There's more, uh, I don't know if you could even make that out. But the ground is all uplifted and cracked. Let's see if I can get it. Yeah, it's not really coming out. Anyway, it's evidence of some kind of gopher or mole or probably not a mole. What's the other one I'm not? Oh, voles. And they will, you know, bury under the, under the ground, tunnel under the ground, and leave these distinctive tracks wherever they go.
Can you hear that helicopter coming? All right, as we're getting in, it's clear, and we'll get to watch him. Looking for those damn cannabis growers, I'm sure. I'm just being sarcastic. They never hurt anybody. Now the police, they definitely hurt people. Now I'm regretting talking politics on this. Oh, you can check out the, uh, this is the mock orange. It's finally starting to get really leafy. Growing in that bending habit. Sending up these beautiful leaves, actually. Very thin and delicate. I believe last time they were just starting to bud. Now this is the same stream we crossed before, we're just uh, down below it. Another crossing, making a big loop. You got all these dogwoods growing underneath it. Nice little lupin patch. No flowers yet, so I have no idea what it is. And some big old madrones. Wonder how old those suckers are.
stream's cutting a nice little gorge down there. You can see where these uh, madrones are growing. They're really holding the bank together. Look at that root. It's holding back all that sediment. Well now, here's a treat. Got a nice trillium, purple trillium. Well, maybe not purple trillium. This is probably the uh, giant wake robin, maybe narrow petal. I don't know too well without my books. Check out those flower parts in there. So these guys, when they make their seeds, they, they cover the seeds with a like an oily casing, which is really attractive to ants. And then the ants will go collect all the seeds, bring them down into their nest, eat the oily part, and then discard the viable part of the seed. And that's how the next generation of trilliums gets going. So they're actually ant dispersed. See, look at these beauties. They make these nice little colonies where there's probably multiple seeds. There's a couple there that haven't flowered and just, look at the modeling on that leaf. It looks almost like a digital or like a camouflage. Here's some ugly ass English ivy that's just taken over the hillside. That's an invasive. And uh, yeah, that's eventually gonna overtake those trilliums there. That's why you don't want invasive species. They just take up space that could be inhabited by something so much more pretty. See, you can see this happening right here. There's a this is cut leaf blackberry, which is I think Rubus ursinus. And yeah, just kind of growing over those trilliums, just gonna crowd them all out. Not a good plant. This, on the other hand, is a native rubus. This is the white bark raspberry. Look at that white blush on that bark. White blush or bloom? I'm gonna go with bloom. Bloom sounds right. So yeah, they send up these big canes. Oh, look at that. You got some sort of like some kind of prunus flower down there. That's probably not a native. That might be the cherry plum. Oh, here's some close by. Look at the leaves. These ones don't have flowers. It's a no good plant next to a no good plant. Next to a no good plant. So I wonder if there was a bunch of disturbance here or something that just allowed all this stuff to get going. Yeah, you got Ian, a dandelion way back here. Dandelion could have blown in, though. The other stuff could have been brought by birds. Maybe it wasn't people. But holy hell. Look at the size of this trillium. I just want to hold my hand up to that. Look at that. That's how big that sucker is. Gorgeous. Oh, you can see pollen in there. Look at that pollen. Those are some of the weirdest flower parts I've ever seen. Love me some trillions, though. Yeah, I'm gonna say this is cherry plum, because look at all these stands here. Probably just self-spreading at this point. No good. You know, around the... Uh, riparian areas where you have the little streams, you get a lot of invasives because there's ample water, you know, the birds come to take a drink, and they shit out whatever seeds they got in their guts. People come through, like me, and carry seeds on their shoes. This is like Curly Dock, another invasive. 
But here we got some nice uh, big leaf maple, which last time we're just sending up shoots. This one's a native, native tree. Now it's got full leaves. Yeah, a lot more trilliums. All along here is trilliums. Maybe not for too much longer if, uh, you know, all this invasive dock right here, just flowers and spreads, they, they just make so many seeds per plant. It's really hard to control. You have to come through and pick them all at the right time and there's no will for that. So we're gonna break a little bit from the stream and head up this way. Mainly because if I follow that stream, then I have a major hill to climb to get back. I don't really feel like doing that today. So we'll take this trail, which is a nice leisurely uphill pace. Even though, you know, not being next to the water, you get less diversity. Because only what can handle really, I mean, severely drying out in the summer can grow out here. And, you know, luckily there's like really pretty thick canopy, relatively anyway. So not a lot of light gets down there. Ooh, here's a beauty. Check out this uh, fertility. If I can get it to focus, I have to put my hand behind it. Just does not want to focus. There we go. Look at that beauty. Now I wonder, this looks like the brown bells to me, but usually they're more brown on the outside, and usually they got some like red on the inside. So this might not be it. But just look at the color of those anthers, like purple and orange, and it's got yellow colors and green in there and black, and it's like a rainbow. That is a beautiful plant. Fritillaria. Maybe Micrantha? Maybe not. We got a little inconspicuous plant. I believe this is Little Prince's Pine. I've actually been watching this one all winter and into spring because I gotta wait for it to flower to really tell whether it's just a small version of the Prince's Pine or whether this is actually the Little Prince's Pine. It just seems so tiny that it's probably the Little Prince's Pine. We're finally starting to get some new growth in there so Hopefully, the next few weeks, be able to solve that mystery. It's been plaguing me all winter. And yeah, that's an evergreen, so you can see it all winter. I think it's in the wintergreen family, which I don't know if all the wintergreens are evergreen, but with a name like wintergreen, I think I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure that's the case.
Oh, here, I'll point this out. I've been trying to figure out what this is for a while. Um, so, let's get a focus. So you can see little flower parts there, very tiny. It almost looks like a grass, right? But uh, actually there's three kinds of grass-like plants. There's sedges, rushes, and grasses. And uh, there's a little saying that um, sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses are hollow all the way to the ground. So feeling this one, it's definitely round. So if we take one of these guys off, let's look at the bottom. Um, well, you won't be able to see it on camera, but it's definitely not hollow. So this is a rush of some kind, but I cannot find information or any lookalikes anywhere about this guy. Um, so maybe if you know, you can tell me. Anyway, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about sedges and rushes and grasses. So you maybe weren't aware that there were three grass-like plants uh, and the sedges with their, when they say it has edges, it's referring to they're usually, the stems are triangular. So that's a pretty cool way to tell when you found a sedge. There are none back here, of course, but, uh, you know, once you learn what to look for, you start seeing them everywhere. They usually grow in like wetter areas, but occasionally they'll grow, you know, where there's like a seep or some underground water water. Excuse me. Oh sweet, I can finally show you those Pacific dogwood flowers. These are growing right off the edge of the trail here, within my grasp. So, look at how gorgeous that is. They're quite big, right? And the whole tree ends up being covered in them. And when, this is a small example, but, you know, these trees can get maybe 50 feet tall, just covered in these big white flowers. They're absolutely gorgeous. So I don't understand why people want to plant these ornamental dogwoods when you have this beautiful native dogwood that you can put in your yard. But, you know, a lot of what people does doesn't make sense to me, so. Anyway, I guess that's probably a good place to stop, because we're just heading up into some area where there's like just some power lines and just a bunch of manzanitas and scrubs that have grown in, you know, where the power company came through and like wiped out what was this kind of forest, I'm assuming, in order to give some guys his electric. But uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching.